land and he worked with local communities in championing their rights to the land and the environment that they that they relied on um, so on on the day of, of Witty's murder he was showing journalists around the site of an illegal timber operation in the south of Cambodia um, and we'll never know exactly what happened on that day um, but he was shot dead and as was a military police officer uh, and the only suspect in the case was a private security guard who had been hired by the logging company. And this case did go to trial, um, but it was a complete joke. Um, there was no real analysis done of, this, of the, um, the crime scene. There were, there, was no, there were no fingerprints taken, there was no gunpowder analysis, no, um, no analysis of, of bullet casings, etc. Some of the key witnesses were absent in court on the, on the occasion of the trial. And the official verdict was that uh, Chuck Woody had been shot by the military police officer. The security guard had then tried to disarm the military police officer and in doing so had accidentally shot him dead. So that security guard ended up serving a few weeks in jail for the accidental murder of the military policeman and Woody's death went unpunished. Now, three weeks after this incident, a 14-year-old girl was killed in a land dispute between her community and the national government. It was a, it was a, a big agricultural company that, that grabbed a plot of land. Um, a couple of months after that, a journalist who'd been investigating illegal timber cartels was found beaten up and murdered in the boot of his car, and neither of them were ever investigated, let, let alone, you know, um, punished. So at Global Witness, we were obviously very upset about the death of our friend, but we also suspected that this was by no means unique problem to Cambodia, but it, it represented a much more global phenomenon. So we, we embarked on a process to research and document similar such deaths globally. And as Phil mentioned, we published a report in April called Deadly Environment, which documents the, the deaths of environmental and land defenders. And by environmental and land defenders, I mean people who are peacefully protesting their right to their land and their environment in either their personal capacity or their professional capacity. Um, and what the report found was that there's been a dramatic increase in these deaths over the last decade. Um, we're talking a current average of two deaths per week, at least. Um, and it's a very global phenomenon. Um, Latin America and Southeast Asia are, are worst hit. The most dangerous countries to be an environmental defender, according to our research, are Brazil, Honduras, and the Philippines currently. Um, and 2012 was the most dangerous year on record with 147 deaths, which is nearly three times what it was in 2002. Um, there are a number of, of um, disconcerting patterns in these deaths. Uh, one is impunity. Of, of all of the deaths that we documented, there was only a 1% conviction rate. Underreporting is also a, a huge problem. There's very little information in the public domain on the deaths of environmental and land um, activists. <clears throat> um, and of course, these two these two things are very much interrelated, right? So there is a lack of systematic monitoring, information collation, <clears throat> which means that deaths are going un underreported, unnoticed, and then you know people are getting away with it. Um, I'll, I'm almost finished, sorry, but I, you, you asked about the drivers. <clears throat> and obviously, as I mentioned, um, pressures, pressure on land is, is, has never been more acute. Of the cases we documented, two-thirds related to disputes over land grabbing or the unfair distribution of land. <clears throat> um, and driving factors include, obviously, population growth, climate change is swallowing up arable habitable land through floods, droughts, and storms, and also increasing global demand for products like beef, timber, palm oil, soy, is meaning that large landowners and companies are looking for new land to, to, to grow commodities for exports. Um, and what's happening is that companies are striking secretive deals with governments without the consent of local communities, um, which is upping the likelihood that land will be contested. And increasingly, ordinary people are being pitched against <coughs> very powerful economic interests, purely because they live on potentially valuable 
parcels of land. Um, and a, a lot of the deaths we, docu we documented were fatal protests, fatal crackdowns on protest actions, but there were also very many that were the result of hired assassins. Um, in Brazil, for example, there are a number of cases um, involving two masked gunmen on motorbikes who disappeared from the scene of the crime. And, and you know, globally we're looking at a situation now in which there are many countries where it's cheaper to hire a contract killer than it is to buy an iPhone. Certainly the reporting in South Africa over the last 10 years, it's been reported, um, I think that there have been 43 deaths, not including Marikana. So uh, Marikana was uh, uh, with 37 miners, striking miners, got uh, shut down by police um, and we're in the middle of a commission of inquiry. But certainly what has emerged is absolute complicity between the mining company and the state and, and using police to deal with what was really um, a dispute between employers and, and, uh, and, and workers um, and was not dealt with in, in that way at all. It was dealt with brutally and, and using force. Um, but uh, the, the statistics to gather the deaths around protest are used, uh, rely primarily on the media. Um, so there really is very poor methodology in terms of actually obtaining those statistics. Um, and I imagine uh, that uh, th that problem is, is, exists throughout Africa as well, which, which would, would account to low levels of, of uh, of statistics, um, but based on the fact that they're not being reported in the media. Um, but yeah, South, South, South Africa, rely, all our statistics um, have relied solely on, on media reports. Yeah. Um, I recognize and, and see Clement Voulet, from, who's my colleague from ISHR, but also relevantly to this discussion, an expert member of the African Commission's working group on, on human rights in the extractive industries. And I wonder if, uh, Clement, you could build on Tessa's response at all and comment on the, the trend more broadly in Africa in this area. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Um, yes, I mean, it's true that uh, from, your, from the Global Witness reports, there is uh, probably less or non, uh, there is quite few number of the cases from Africa. Uh, it doesn't mean that in Africa, land environment or defenders working on extractive industry doesn't fit this risk. The reason only is that uh, the nature of the perpetrator make difficult sometimes defenders to really report and to report this with. Most of the defenders that work on, uh, if we take the example of extractive industry, they work at community level. So, and uh, sometimes people that are involved in the violation of uh, our violation of human rights uh, is sometimes the, the extractive industry themselves in general, but also the private security that's the extractive. And so, and I think that's also another thing important also to highlight here because most of the risk that defenders face, they face it, they, this risk come mainly from the private security have at the extractive industry or businesses. And during our mission, we also hear some cases where we have defenders that's reported to their community leader which asked them you have to keep quiet because this is this is against the interest of the communities and b when we when we try to, to to discuss and know m more about we see that those community leaders are really close or either they receive some uh, money from the company so in this context and sometimes also the, the company also go through the families and ask this community, the families, you have to make sure that uh, your, your, your husband don't say anything because we are here to help you. And in this context, it's sometimes difficult for these defenders to report mm -hmm. because they want to continue to work in their communities. And, and, some, and also another, another aspect also is also the state institution is weak. So at the community level, there is no there is no, uh, uh, no mean for the defenders in case they are targeted by this company. So we have the case in, uh, in, in Congo, where in East Congo, we have with the natural resources issue, and we have the case of Kilwa, where there was a lot of, a lot of killing, and, uh, including defenders, but there was not any reporting, and also national authorities were not able to do, because there are also some points involved on that. So just to say that there's the, 
the issue is important in Africa, and we, from uh, Ogoni issue, from Nigeria issue, from uh, Sierra Leone, uh, for, and also we have recently case from Tanzania, where some environmental defenders left, but the problem was that those environmental defenders don't want their case to be public, because they are expecting to go back, and they don't want. So this sometimes makes things really challenge, probably because they, they don't trust on uh, the existence a mechanism to protect them. How, how do we make sure that uh, we can give them a strong message so that they can come out and to be able to report these cases? That's one. Thank you. Yeah, just on that note, um, we the, the work that we do with communities um, and the complicity with some community leaders um, is particularly stark in South Africa where the traditional leadership was perverted under the apartheid era um, and traditional leaders uh, um, were complicit in the apartheid regime uh, and traditional leaders who weren't were not recognized. And um, we've been representing communities, um, right to assembly um, and right to freedom of expression um, against um, traditional leaders. Um, and often what happens is, is, is exactly what you were saying, that communities are scared um, to speak out and to report because of their own traditional structures. But what's also interesting is those traditional communities, some have been awarded mining licenses in South Africa. So you got the community leaders who are supposed to be representatives of the community also having a direct interest um, in, the, in the mining companies themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Yes, uh, of course, we, uh, from the uh, discussions that we had uh, uh, today uh, and also discussions that uh, Margaret Sekagia had with uh, defenders, we see that uh, the threats, uh, harassments, uh, and um, uh, intimidations faced by uh, all defenders uh, looks uh, like the same, like being the same, and uh, they are facing the same uh, threats as other defenders. While at the same time, uh, uh, what you also mentioned that uh, uh, they are also, uh, in some occasions, uh, uh, otherwise trend, uh, threatened. They are, for instance, uh, socially uh, stigmatized. And they are, uh, and we receive uh, many reports in that regard, uh, labeled as uh, enemies of the states uh, or anti development or anti government. And uh, that's something I'll see that uh, we should uh, look at uh, uh, when we uh, deal with the uh, issue of defenders uh, and, and business. Uh, I would like also to, to mention the, uh, situ the particular situation of women defenders uh, who are uh, particularly targeted uh, as uh, they often work in isolated. Uh, places and communities, uh, they often face uh, pressure, uh, they often face uh, gender-based uh, violence, uh, and uh, it has been also mentioned that their families and their relatives are also uh, subject to uh, uh, threats, uh, and uh, they are also affected because the, of the threats uh, uh, to their families. And uh, in that regard, we uh, have in our database uh, many examples, uh, concrete examples uh, uh, in countries. Uh, I may mention Guatemala, uh, Ecuador, and we have the case of uh, uh, Maria would, would probably describe better than I, the case of uh, um, uh, that, that she's facing. And we also, uh, in the case of uh, extractive industries, uh, the case of, of Thailand, that would also take a, as a good example of uh, specific uh, threats that uh, defenders are facing facing uh, when they deal with uh, business. Um, it, it is important to highlight that other forms of criminalization and harassment to human rights defenders highlight our work. In fact, all the energies which should be dedicated to the compliance with their mandate has to be rechannelized to their ju judicial defense, which independence, um, I I impedes our work. Um, I will say that um, we have a very beautiful constitution in our, our country, really robust. It's really um, um, interesting to see all the rights that we have inside, even that we, we have recognized the rights of the nature in our constitution in 2008, which is really great. But nevertheless, uh, the Ecuadorian state has in recent years ignored these advances and has applied subjective procedures to the regulation of the social movements that defend rights of the indigenous peoples <coughs> and that defend rights of nature. So for example, um, it's really difficult now uh, become part of the um, social movements that provide inputs for, uh, for the creation of a public policy. You are not allowed anymore 
to participate in the promotion of political policies, public, public policies. You are not allowed to go and participate in a protest because you are uh, in disagreement uh, regarding the oil expansion or the mining expansion. And uh, there are many uh, criminalizations uh, to the indigenous peoples that are uh, against of these uh, uh, policies uh, of extending oil uh, uh, in their lands. So it's imperative that the free prior and informed consent process um, be fulfilled in Ecuador according to the international human rights standards which did not occur in the 11 round of oil project that is affecting more than 3 million hectares in the tropical rainforest. Um, so we, need, we are facing this. We cannot protest. We cannot participate in public policies through a decree that um, is, um, go, is, is a, a creation, is, uh, was created last year in 2013, and this is a challenge for um, human rights defenders in this moment. Well, all of the human rights issues that we've heard uh, just now from the panel have been reflected in the work in the, of the committee during my period as a member. Um, uh, the, the, the range of abuses is shocking. Uh, I'll come back to that later because there is also a curiosity, a problem about the way the treaty bodies deal with these violations. But I'd like to flag an aspect of the human rights abuses that we haven't paid attention to yet, and that has to do with the enormous imbalance of power between uh, the uh, corporate sector and human rights defenders. Uh, in this imbalance of power, Power, the corporate sector can carry out actions which appear otherwise legal, but which will lead to highly abusive outcomes. Uh, and let me use freedom of expression as an example. Um, we not only have violations of freedom of expression through the egregious, outrageous actions such as killing and um, abduction and so forth, but we also have um, interferences with the right through what at the domestic level is a legal invocation of defamation laws, uh, which can have dreadful effects. The company doesn't even need to get a judgment. The very fact of litigation will often be enough uh, to silence the voices, not least because of the huge costs involved and the practice of injunctive relief, which is commonplace, at least in countries that have inherited the common law tradition. Um, another example of these otherwise legal tools uh, has to do with the way the media can be controlled. Um, uh, companies can withhold advertising. Uh, companies have very sophisticated public relations departments who can easily outgun, if I may use that term inappropriately, uh, the human rights defenders who are trying to engage in the same activities. Now, these may not engage legal violation issues at the domestic level, but they certainly do engage state responsibility at the international level, and perhaps that's an aspect we might come back to later in the discussion. Thank you. I'm um, the permit observer of the Council of Europe here in Geneva, and I'm following somehow to uh, the comment made by Mr. O'Flaherty on, on the softer uh, manners of uh, obstruct the work of the journalist. And uh, I think uh, uh, in the context of the new uh, era of communication, we should uh, take uh, uh, very seriously into account what is going on with the uh, right to freedom of expression uh, uh, in the internet context. And uh, uh, the Council of Europe in that respect uh, identified a number of problems and adopted the uh, declaration in 2011 on uh, uh, what was uh, called denial of services attacks against the website of human rights defenders by privately owned internet platforms. And that is uh, uh, some, sometimes uh, taking the shape of a uh, 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 free market uh, expression, but it is not very often they are, uh, these obstructions are motivated by political pressure uh, or uh, uh, have an economic compulsion at this, uh, in turn uh, motivated uh, politically. Uh, usually the company is concerned would invoke as justification mere compliance with the, their terms of service uh, and this is why the Committee of Ministers uh, recommended states to reinforce politics that uh, would uh, reinforce uh, uh, would uphold the freedom of expression for human rights defenders uh, against such attack. Uh, uh, another, another is uh, where human rights defenders are targeted by private, uh, private media uh, 
apparently, but uh, they, uh, they would be nevertheless de facto uh, governmentally, uh, governmentally controlled. Uh, another issue, and it is also related to, to somehow um, uh, to the, uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Force mentioned, is uh, uh, this um, uh, labeling uh, human rights defenders as enemy as traitors. Uh, uh, the Council of Europe, through its uh, Venice Commission, uh, actually took uh, a strong position uh, against what was called the foreign agent uh, law in, in Russia, then uh, uh, copied uh, in Ukraine in early 2014. So these are all very uh, sensible uh, expressions of uh, obstruction of the work of the human rights defenders. If you uh, go back into the reports that uh, my predecessor presented to the General Assembly, you would find uh, a series of uh, concrete recommendations that are also useful for me uh, to take on, and uh, it is uh, also my intention to promote uh, a better reading, better understanding of the uh, reports uh, uh, presented uh, by uh, Margaret Sekai in the past. I uh, just wanted to, to mention two of them. Uh, the first is the uh, uh, report uh, uh, which uh, presents uh, uh, the elements of a safe uh, and enabling environment. I don't have time to, to go into details, but I just wanted to encourage all of you to uh, uh, read this report and to look at the possibility to implement uh, uh, some of the uh, recommendations at, uh, at, country, at country level. I also want to, uh, to discuss with uh, my, colleague, uh, my colleagues' uh, country mandates uh, the possibility to look at this uh, framework when they prepare their reports on, on national situation and to look at uh, the situation of defenders in the ground uh, if the uh, framework is also applicable to uh, the countries uh, they have in charge. Uh, the second report is the, the recent report that uh, Margaret presented at the uh, General Assembly uh, last year, <coughs> which is um, a report on, on the rights-based approach to uh, uh, programming uh, uh, and policy making, and in which you would see, you would find a, a set uh, of principles that uh, I don't have time to, to present today, but only uh, maybe uh, uh, highlight three of them. The, the first of them is the, the principle of, of participation, and uh, uh, she also, in, in the report, uh, highlight the fact that uh, those excluded uh, from uh, decision making should be uh, able to voice their concerns and, and their opinion. We should look at the possibility for them to uh, uh, give a voice to their, to their concern. The second principle that she developed in the report was the principle of uh, transparency and uh, access to information. And uh, I should recall that uh, information should be uh, made uh, available for rights holders and uh, those uh, uh, whose rights are or might be affected by uh, a business project should be also consulted uh, on, on, on the project and have access to information. And the, the third element is that uh, access to information should be provided in, a, in the language that people could, uh, could, could read. And uh, in my experience on Haiti, uh, I have many examples on uh, business uh, companies coming to Haiti trying to invest, but uh, taking time to, to speak in, in the proper language to the Haitian people, not speaking uh, French nor speaking Creole, and uh, it creates a, a lot of misunderstanding between uh, workers in Haiti yeah, and business uh, companies. Yeah, the third one, uh, of course, and I should also mention that I intend to discuss with the uh, chair of the working group on business and human rights uh, on this uh, third principle is the question of accountability and, and the question of redress mechanisms. Uh, of course, we, the guiding principles contained a series of uh, recommendations in that regard, but uh, we need to make sure that uh, those uh, mechanisms are really accessible to the, uh, uh, to the uh, human rights defenders and to the, uh, the people concerned. Uh, the victims should have the possibility to claim responsibility. Uh, they should have the possibility to obtain effective uh, remedy and redress. Uh, and um, states also have the possibility, but or not, not only the possibility, but the responsibility uh, to uh, fight against impunity. And impunity is also one of the subjects that I intend to uh, discuss with uh, my colleagues, special reporters on, on thematic issues. Just to be clear, our report is looking at land and environmental defenders as a kind of a subset of human rights defenders, and we actually would like them to be tr given special attention because of the specific threats that, that they are posed with. But um, uh, yeah, just to briefly talk through our recommendations for national governments, I mean, a good starting point would obviously be to implement the provisions of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders with 
special attention to states' duty to, <coughs> to protect, promote and implement all human rights, including the right to a safe and healthy environment. Um, we also, as I just mentioned, we do want governments to address the specific risks posed to land and environmental defenders in the, hu in the UN Human Rights Council's um, periodic review process, both in their own rec recommendation, uh, in their own report, sorry, and in their recommendations to other states. Um, in country, we want to make sure that any allegations of intimidation or violence against land and environmental defenders is properly investigated. And by properly investigated, I mean promptly investigated, impartially investigated, that perpetrators are brought to justice and that there is adequate redress for victims. Um, and a very critical preventative measure will be that any potentially affected communities um, by investment or extractive, extractive projects are genuinely giving their free, prior and informed consent before a deal is done. Um, and very quickly, on our recommendations for companies, I mean, companies should refuse to make any, any investment decision, any project plan without the consent of communities. Um, we also want them to stay out of militarized areas, to, to refrain from hiring private security forces if there's any allegation or history of human rights violations. And it's also really critical that companies have a very good understanding of their supply chains to make sure that they are not associated with other companies who are carrying out social or environmental abuses. Yeah, well, the, I mentioned earlier that there's a problem with treaty body findings, at least of the Human Rights Committee, and that is that the specific issue of human rights defenders and business is completely invisible. Um, I took the 10 worst cases in the Global Witness Report, uh, and I'm, uh, they, where the highest number of fatalities, and I matched that to the concluding observations of those states. Every one of them had been through the procedure in recent years. Not a single concluding observation made reference to the specific dimension we're exploring today. I'm not saying that the killings and the atrocities were ignored. They weren't. But they were clustered together and lost in general statements about um, right to life or protection of human rights defenders. So in a way, we've become a victim of our own success. The human rights defenders are now systematically referenced in concluding observations, uh, which is very important, but it's time to disaggregate the phenomena. Uh, uh, and for example, the issue of the, the challenges of uh, engaging with business need to be rendered visible. Thank you. Uh, well, in fact, I, uh, I'm currently planning a, a series of um, uh, consultation with uh, regional uh, bodies, regional organizations, uh, in which uh, I envisage to uh, raise the uh, specific question of uh, defenders working uh, in the area of business. Uh, I'm uh, currently planning uh, to have discussions with the, uh, with the EU, and uh, next week in the framework of the 10th anniversary of the uh, EU guidelines on human rights defenders, uh, in my statement I will have a specific reference uh, to those uh, defenders working in business that are currently subject to uh, intimidation, threats or stigmatizations. And I will do the same with uh, the Inter American Commission and the same with the uh, African uh, Commission. Uh, uh, I also, of course, pay uh, a particular attention uh, to the, uh, the persons and the organizations that are currently are facing uh, reprisals. Uh, uh, because their engagement uh, and cooperation with the United Nations uh, and uh, the uh, uh, human rights uh, mechanisms. And uh, there seems to be a growing trend uh, currently uh, in many countries, in many regions, uh, on uh, targeting, uh, stigmatizing, defaming and intimidating uh, and even criminalizing human rights defenders. Uh, and uh, recent cases, recent examples uh, are famous on uh, involving uh, China, Sri Lanka, recently Vietnam, and I also heard uh, of incidents here in the Palais de Nations in the corridors of uh, defenders uh, have been, uh, having been uh, uh, threatened by uh, uh, ambassadors because they have uh, simply uh, uh, spoken before the, the Council on, on, on country uh, situations. Uh, and this is not acceptable, and I'm intending to be, uh, to be uh, very vocal and to uh, raise the issue in my discussions with uh, governments uh, and with the, uh, the rest of the uh, United Nations. 
Of course, I would uh, call the international community to adopt uh, the uh, resolution that would create uh, this uh, focal point that could be uh, one way to engage all the uh, United Nations systems uh, in a better uh, dealing with the uh, situation of reprisals. Um, and of course, uh, as my uh, predecessor, Margaret Sekaga, did, uh, I'm planning to uh, continue to draw attention on the uh, challenges uh, that the group of defenders uh, uh, are currently facing. Uh, and this will be done uh, both in my uh, country uh, reports uh, to the uh, General Assembly uh, and to the Council, but also in discussions that I intend to hold with uh, uh, governments in coming uh, months during my country visits. Um, has shown that uh, where voluntary rules are not sufficient uh, to ensure access to remedies to the victims of human rights violations in which DNCs are involved. Indeed, there are gaps in protection in the current voluntary standards. So, for example, the asymmetry of uh, norms protected TNCs in the frame of trade and development project are not covered um, and all by the existing standards. And furthermore, existing norms have also not been sufficient to ensure criminalization, for example, of human rights defenders or lack of access to remedies for affected communities. Um, the fact that these standards are not binding make very difficult its implementation. Um, we support the claims of the Treaty Alliance and consider that this is the momentum to advance beyond existing voluntary standards to ensure the adopt adaptation of binding norms. These binding norms, of course, should include obligations of the states and TNCs and TNCs to respect the human rights defenders. I recognize that the definition of the content of such a treaty is complex work. And therefore, we think uh, that the space to create it should be established as soon as possible. It is important um, Established as soon as, uh, it is important to have a public debate, which often are in conflict of interest due to their relationship with business, of course. And the states are those who should uh, initiate the debate and ensure to put the victims of violations at the center of the debate, while ensuring that the voices of affected communities are heard and taken into account when defining the context of the treaty. Uh, for Ecuadorian people, for um, the Ecuadorian basin, the Amazon basin countries, I think it's really important to have um, at least, uh, and it's imperative to recognize the free prior consents again for indigenous peoples that are living in the tropical rainforest. Um, do we believe that in the past, for example, we used to go to the stakeholders, to different companies in the north, in the United States, to talk, talk to them and educate them about the collective rights in, in our countries. But now with new uh, commercial relations with Asia and China and Korea, we don't know who are going to speak to. So the governments need to ensure that, that the collective rights, that the rights of human defenders must be in these negotiations. So we claim and we ask our governments to put forward this treatment. Thank you. I think the starting point is if we're serious about human rights and we're serious about the mandate to promote and protect human rights and we acknowledge that states are often complicit with business um, or lack of capacity in terms of implementation, then we have to support the role of human rights defenders um, in all countries. Um, so we as an organization absolutely uh, support um, the human rights defenders uh, incorporated into either resolution. We don't believe the resolutions are mutually exclusive. Um, we think that there is space for um, the Norway resolution to uh, uh, improve the implementation of the guiding principles, but also that there is space to start the discuss discussions around a binding treaty um, in terms of the Ecuador resolution, which, would, which will invariably take a very long time. Um, so, but we absolutely support uh, the human rights defenders incorporated into either resolution. 
Justice, in addition to what I've already heard, um, and how these will be expressed is for others to craft, but these are elements are, are of ideas. In the first place, I do think that resolutions need to reflect the trans null issue without. Typically, we're talking about do not exist and live exclusively in one state, and that quality has got to be captured so that the resolution is not seen as speaking to distinct state, 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 but rather to a, a, a global problem. Secondly, I would like to see encouragement wherever it's appropriate uh, for imaginative work by the special procedures. I know I'm speaking to the converted when I encourage rapporteurs such as Michelle to conduct joint operations with the other relevant mandate holders. We heard an early reference here today of the relationship with the working group, uh, uh, the, the, the business and human rights working group. Uh, but for it's in these frameworks, uh, why not undertake joint missions uh, to carefully selected countries, the purpose of which is not only uh, to address the issues in those countries, but to get this discussion uh, right out there uh, front and center on the international stage. And when I say visit the affected countries, also visit the co countries wh wh which headquarter uh, the corporations that are giving concern. Uh, so so uh, uh, comprehensively deal with the issue in that manner. And um, finally, uh, perhaps this isn't for a resolution, but I, I need to say it somewhere. <laughs> and, and that is that we shouldn't just talk vaguely and generically about remedies. Uh, we need to think through the nature of remedies for the problems we're talking about. Very commonly, the human rights defenders are also the victims uh, of, the, um, uh, of the action, such as the confiscation of land, the destruction of the environment. And is money, uh, and beyond the criminal and moving to the civil, is money really the solution, which we often think is what we're talking about when we talk of remedies? I think far more important is to explore uh, the significance of restitution. Uh, as the only meaningful um, uh, re remedy uh, in the context of many of the uh, crimes and the abuses that we're referring here today. And perhaps that's not for the re resolution, but it is a dimension that needs some reflection. One year back, uh, we, we carried out a research on oil rush in Eastern Horn of Africa, particularly on Tanzania and Uganda human rights defenders who are working in this issue. And what we found is that uh, because the report itself, the title is Only Brave Talks About Oil. The, the subject even human rights defenders are not willing even to discuss, simply because the intimidation is too high. So I might be encouraging the, the st uh, mandate holder from the um, human rights defenders to work also the IE on environment, John Knox, because he brought together and Margaret Sekach participated uh, last, I think, session, a great number of human rights activists working in this area. And now uh, their thoughts and reflections, I think, has been put together in a report. And I think there's good recommendations to follow up on that. And uh, joint visit and joint actions on that, it will be nice. Particularly, I should be emphasizing, I don't take one more minute, uh, the, the importance of implementation of what we have already there in terms of state parties taking that commitment. Like UK now uh, have done it, incorporating into the national strategies about instructing their companies and their corporate entities to follow those guidelines strictly. I thank you very much. Thank you. Um, one of the things the resolution should do maybe in a more emphatic manner is to encourage action at the regional level. Uh, in the Council of Europe, for instance, we have already uh, adopted this year a, a specific document uh, for transposing the UN guiding principle in the uh, 47 member states, and the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a, a resolution which is precisely addressing the needs of the, of the human rights defenders. At the same time, I think it, is, it would be useful, and I guess we you, Mr. Force, you are already in contact with the Commissioner of Human Rights of the Council of Europe because uh, you can have a sort not only exchange of uh, information but also burden sharing. And uh, another direction in which you are going and I think it should be uh, uh, useful uh, as a good practice is that uh, apart from trying to uh, develop uh, only uh, new instruments, we are trying to get uh, 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 best use of the, of the uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights because as a, as a matter of fact, this is the most dynamic part of the of the whole system in the sense that the practices are taking on board and they become jurisprudence. Thank you. Well, uh, we, we don't have much time, I understand, uh, as the, the discussion is on the resolution or resolutions, uh, just to say that we uh, would like to make an appeal to civil society to help us to have one strong resolution in this uh, session of the Human Rights Council. Uh, the resolution presented by the core group uh, has evolved in a direction which uh, I think would go in the direction of what many civil society 
organizations would like to see the mention of a legally binding instrument is uh, now included in the draft as uh, in brackets if we have only one resolution. And I really hope that with uh, uh, civil society, but also with Ecuador and with all others, we can work uh, for one resolution which would include the views of all uh, and reach a consensus. Uh, our language on human rights defenders is uh, something I'm happy to share with the civil society organization, something I'm happy to um, and to discuss with civil society organizations so that we have also that strong element in the resolution by the co-group. Thank you. Uh, I think that in any resolution uh, at this council has to probably be more and mention the need for to recognize defenders that work on business and human rights at the local level because what we have today is most of the resolution talk about communities' rights and forgets about those who protect these community rights. I want also to highlight one thing that is important is that it's also the role of national human rights institutions at the national level in protection. Most of the national human rights institutions have today business and human rights component, but the only thing they do with the uh, defenders is to collect information, but they don't have any strategy in case those defenders are at risk. So is it really important? And my last point also, like I mentioned it before, uh, most of defenders working on uh, if we if we left out organized NGO like uh, uh, Foundation Pushamama or other NGO, most of the defenders that work on communities level, either they were themselves victim, and because they are victim, they become defender because they organize themselves to protect, and they don't know. Most of them don't know anything about current legislation, current procedure. So it is important to make awareness this at the national level in order to make sure that they can come out and, 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 and help them to be able to voice them uh, the risk that they are facing at the national level. I think it's only by doing that that we will be able also to give them protection at the, at the local level. Uh, and for ISHR's part, we certainly uh, strongly urge uh, the, the, the sponsors and co-sponsors of the resolutions to ensure they adopt specific human rights defender language, um, uh, language which both recognises the role that the defenders play in promoting corporate responsibility, the threats and risks that they face by consequence of that work, and then specific calls on the part of states to protect and support defenders, and also to investigate and ensure accountability for attacks against defenders.